Simon Inglethorpe. I'm a journalist for the ENDS report. Um, I think what's interesting for me is how the issue of consumption kept uh, emerging in many of the talks. Uh, it's a really question, I guess, for, for, for the Secretary of State. Um, um, David Norman told us that addressing consumption is a key Rio Plus 20 challenge, and Tim told us over consumption is a form of food waste, and uh, I think Sally mentioned that uh, reconnecting consumers with food and, and oxidizing them as kind of isolated individuals on the end of a food chain was important. Um, so I was going to ask, uh, how is the UK government going to, is it going to have consumption on its agenda for Rio Plus 20? Yeah, it does. And this is something we absolutely have to do in conjunction with business um, and with civil society, because it's ultimately about changing behaviours, and that's notoriously difficult to do. We do, particularly in this country, have a legacy of a cheap food policy. You know, Harriet said, I mean, that was the express determination of successive post-war governments after rationing. But I think we are undergoing another revolution where, you know, the, the salience of food, its cost, the interest in where it's come from and the ethics around it are of increasing interest to, um, to consumers. And the key to this, I think, is... Um, lies in, in the retailer's observation that people want to do the right thing, but you've got to make it easy for them. So some of the language we've used today is in an audience of aficionados, and you understand what we mean by biodiversity and sustainability, but you know, quite frankly, the average person doesn't always understand that, and you have to, to translate it into terms that help them to do what they instinctively want to do right. So sustainable palm oil, they don't <coughs> understand its presence in the food label, even if in a busy shopper gets around to reading the food label. But they are very, very concerned about the loss of species. And you talk to them about the loss of orangutans that arise from the deforestation that uh, has occurred because we've translated those previously forested areas into plantations for palm, and they do understand, they do care, then they want to be able to reach for the choice that gives expression to their desire to do the right thing. So I think one of the challenges we have together is how we get that right. And uh, that, that's a particular challenge in relation to food waste. We waste 12 billion pounds worth of food a year in this country. When you think of the times we're living through, that's actually indefensible. And we have to find ways, again, in conjunction with retailers, to help people um, waste less. I mean, there are interesting shopping patterns changing, I'm told by retailers. People shop more frequently for smaller amounts, and then they get less discard mm. at the back of the fridge. I mean, everybody does it, me too, you know, you, leave, you forget about something. But actually, I think that is changing, and it's finding all these ways in which we can help people to do the right thing and, and harness their instinctive desire to make choices that are right. Thank you. Yes, quickly, thank you. Uh, so uh, that's all absolutely right. I think the, the, the concern is li looking a little bit further ahead at the kind of scale of transformation in consumption patterns in diets that's going to be necessary. And, and no one's got easy answers here, but let's start addressing this now because it gets more difficult every year that goes by. If, if you, you look at this, this is at the heart of the equity issue that we've been talking about. It's it, the, the issue is that it's quite right that you know, many nations, in particular China, you have spectacular improvements in people's living standards. And with that goes a desire to adopt Western diets. And you can understand that. And in many places, there is a massive need for people to increase more protein. So the question is, how are we going to transform diets here so that there is space for that expansion, for example, of meat and dairy consumption in those places that need it most? I don't have a quick answer to that, but my sense is that it's not going to come down primarily to simple choices and making it easier for consumers to choose differently. We need those win-wins first, absolutely, but in the long run it has to be that the price of food is reflecting genuinely the ecological damage that, for example, occurs through soya production to feed our very high intensive meat habit. And that's a policy question as much as a behaviour change question. Okay. I just wanted to pick up on um, Caroline's point, because I think there is something that the government itself can do, of course, in its own procurement practices. Yes, now, and indeed, you could say that's one of the very positive outcomes of Rio, was that actually that really empowered sustainable development officers throughout this country to look at the sourcing of local councils and local authorities, and actually also to really encourage 
civil society locally to think about sustainability in local government procurement. And then clearly you've also got central government with, you know, the I always um, dream of the day that the MOD and all the squaddies are drinking fair trade tea, because I'm sure they must get through a lot. <laughs> and so definitely I know 18% of GDP or something is government procurement. So there's a huge leadership role that the government can play directly. Obviously, in difficult times, there are cost challenges, but I think it is about saying, you know, we're, we're showing the way. And I, I think what was also really interesting, what was pinpointed by the Sustainable Development Commission, which was t titled, I will if you will, uh, and that the public just need to feel it's becoming the norm, and then they will also embrace it more themselves. And <coughs> we actually did some very interesting research just recently among consumers that showed 40% of consumers would put themselves in a quite actively looking for ethical choices when they're shopping. You know, they're not the tiny 3% grassroots campaigners or whatever, but 40%, I mean, that's yeah. quite mainstream. That's a body mm. of the public yes, that yeah. gives us a, a bedrock, if you like, to take it forward. We've incidentally, we did, you're absolutely right, that, that public procurement, both in you know, local government, central government, can be a big driver of change, and government buying standards now have the mainstreaming of sustainable development, and we have different departments up for scrutiny on a regular basis. I'm not sure when mm. the Ministry of Defence, we, we, are, we are now all held to account for this transition to a more sustainable basis, so I think it's coming, it's coming. David Langlands from PwC's agricultural team. Th there have been various uh, references to food systems and all the players along the value chain and the support players in government that are part of that. Who should take the lead in bringing the various players together and defining priorities? Um, <laughs> I, I think one of the things that's come out for me from this morning is the enormous complexity of these issues. And I think a number of people have said that no individual player in this can get it right. It's got to be a collaborative thing. Clearly, food companies, as major buyers, or you know, that's what we do. We turn raw agricultural produce into value-added things to meet consumer needs. So clearly, we as an industry have a responsibility to source sustainably to try to drive those changes, but we can't do that in isolation. It's also part of the story, and I agree with what the Secretary of State has said around changing consumer behaviour, but in a sense we've got to do that for them. You can't rely on consumers, or you can't expect, it's unfair to expect consumers in addition to all the other things that they've got to weigh up, price, ingredients, allergies, nutrition, everything else, to look at subtle differences. And again, there will be trade-offs. What's good for biodiversity might not be good for water and so on. So we've got to embed this in our products. We've got to get it right. But we need the frameworks within which to do that. And not just the frameworks at national level. Again, uh, you know, we've got to remain competitive in world markets. There's got to be a level playing field. So I think it's, it's all joining together. Um, somebody said, you know, we, if you do it, we will. We've kind of got to hold hands and, and take a collective leap, but it does require political leadership, not just nationally, but internationally. And that, I think, for me, is one of the challenges of Rio, getting Rio to articulate those things and then getting other people to respond to that. But that's where I think the leadership has got to come from. Just very quickly on that, one of the specific things that I think could be transformational would be accounting for sustainability. You know, the companies that do it, um, you know, want that spread as best practice. We will, we're encouraging them to go down and, and, and share what they do. Aviva is a company that is really, really strong proponent of corporate accounting for sustainability and you know the importance of that the reason why I think it will drive change is because investors will want to look in annual reports and be able to compare whether this company or that company really is sustainable along the length of its supply chain and just in case anyone thought that was just as so they felt good look at the huge impact that arose from flooding in other parts of the world, say the floods in Thailand that led to huge impact on the supply chain, I think it was for Honda in Swindon, no man's an island, and everybody has an interest in ba being able to read and understand how companies account for sustainability, the length of their supply chain. Government's role is one as an enabler. You know, we, we are the enabler, we can set a framework, but you, know, you need that combination of the desire on the part of business to do it, the desire on the part of the investors and consumers to know, and then the confidence when you read it in knowing that, that it, you can compare 
one with another on an equal footing. So that's one idea I think would bring change. So um, I've got a little metaphor that I'll leave you with, um, which I think summarises this quite nicely. But I was asked by a Brazilian magazine to answer the question, which is, you know, how governments, business and society can transform and work together to really deliver on the discussions of Rio and transform those theoretical discussions into action. So, of course, the practical action needs to come from government, business and civil society working together. But imagine a musical production. So government needs to set the right stage for action. The stage should feature clear goals, consistent policy, and investment in innovation and skills. Business is our hero, the bold, courageous actor that is prepared to take a few clearly bounded risks so their investors don't go shooting off somewhere else, and speak out and act against the status quo. Our business hero or heroine will be charming and humble because others will want to follow. Civil society is the chorus. Without a chorus, there's no music. Without the full engagement of civil society, there'll only be piecemeal solutions, and sustainability issues will remain at the periphery of everyday life. The chorus is happy to take direction from business and take some cues from the stage set by government, but their musical script is only ever half written. The chorus has to be free to write its part, to find the notes and the rhythm that work for the individual and for the community. And they all share responsibility for the conductor, who in the end is only there to make sure the production works. Well, Sally, I couldn't have summarised it uh, <laughs> better myself. I've, um, I've never been called charming before, but I have been called bold. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, um, I'm very grateful indeed to, um, to all of our speakers for giving up your time. We really appreciate it. And as I say, this event was, um, was held together between Forum for the Future and the Food and Drink Federation. I hope today did help get across that it is businesses which can help turn political aspirations into reality, and that's what Rio is all about. Businesses are the people who make things, create jobs, generate wealth, and apply science and technology to innovate and drive resource efficiency and indeed growth. But we do need frameworks within which to do this, frameworks, frameworks which set goals, um, which allow for a level playing field, without which those who are, are doing the right thing risk being undercut in the market by those who aren't. So thank you all for participating. Um, there is time, as I say, over lunch to continue the questions if you'd like to. Thank you to the Secretary of State especially, and we wish you and the Deputy Prime Minister every success at Rio. Thank, thank you. Very you. Much. Thank you. Thank you.